to uh, stand up here as the elder this morning. I know it's a little challenging <coughs> for him yet at this time because he's still recovering. But we praise the Lord that he's here among us. My message this morning is simply titled, In the Music Plays On. Before we begin, I'd like to pause for another added word of prayer. Most precious Lord, we thank you that you are here with us. Your word tells us that where there are two or more gathered in your name, that you are amongst us, Lord. And we thank you. We ask for your Holy Spirit this morning here in this place to give us truth and understanding, Lord, and to guide my words. Let them be your words and your thoughts, not mine. And we thank you for all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Would you agree that we must maintain hope and perseverance until Jesus comes again? You know, we've often heard the axiom that when life serves us lemons, we should turn the lemons into lemonade. I don't know about you, but sometimes I find that that's not always an easy thing to do. There's been times when I've been confronted by issues that just simply overwhelm me. I twist and turn and I can't see my way around the issue and the circumstances. And even now as we're trying to locate a new home, I find myself twisting and turning and, and not knowing what to do. It's as if my brain at times in my life is just put on hold. How can one turn lemons into lemonade and if, you, if you don't have the water or the sugar or a lemon squeezer? I must confess that there are times when it takes me a few moments to remember that prayer will provide the tools to get beyond the problems that perplex me, amen? It might even be providing us with the smile and a cheerful outlook to overcome the issue or the problem that we confront. I imagine all of you have had similar situations in your life, have you not? Certainly history is fraught with individuals confronted with a situation and finding unique ways to overcome some of life's most difficult problems. For instance, on April 15th, 1912, the RMS Titanic, the unsinkable ship, did the unthinkable, and it sank after hitting an iceberg. Unfortunately, there were not enough lifeboats to accommodate all the passengers and the crew. And famously, a decision was made to save all the women and children first. The Titanic's band, led by Wallace Hartley, played music continuously to keep the passengers calm until the ship finally slipped under the waves in the cold water. You know, there are many legends and myths and folklore surrounding the sink, sinking of the Titanic, but the story of the band in the face of certain death playing music to soothe the passengers is an enduring and true story, is it not? To persevere even under the worst of circumstances is truly a daunting and difficult task, is it not? And still, the band plays on, the music plays on. Sometimes we may not succeed in completing the task we have at hand, yet there is strength and honor even in our attempt, is there not? Paul was often beaten and bruised, and I'm sure felt lonely at times, yet he continued to pursue his task of spreading the gospel message. In our scripture reading this morning from Philippians 3, verses 12 to 14, we're giving these words of encouragement. 
not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press forward to the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul knew that he stood out, didn't he? He knew that he was different. Other people may have looked upon him as being perfect at times and a perfect Christian, but he knew better. And he also knew that he needed to set an example. Paul needed to continue forward, always improving, always reaching for the prize that God is holding out for all believers. And in Luke 9, verse 62, we find this message. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. You know, during the 1992 Bosnian War, the city of Sarajevo came under siege a siege that lasted four years and resulted in thousands of deaths. Vedran Smolovic, a cellist in the Sarajevo String Quartet, was haunted by all the killings and the hunger of the children and the daily steady barrage of bombs falling all around. So every day, he brought his cello in a chair and sat in front, front of a bombed out building in the city square by the Sarajevo River and played his cello. It should be noticed that where he sat every day was in the direct sight of a sniper who was in a bell tower overlooking a bridge. And it was this bridge that was necessary for the citizens to cross in order to reach the market and purchase their food. On some days, the sniper killed as many as 12 men and women and children. Yet Mr. Smolovic was never targeted by the sniper. He played to give encouragement to the living as well as to honor those who had perished. And friends, he played on that street corner for over a year. Even in our deepest grief, we can still inspire others to persevere and to hope, can we not? And still, the music plays on. Paul speaks of this in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Paul's is, Paul is telling us not to resign ourselves to our fate, but to keep on trying, to keep on moving, to keep on challenging what fate throws our way. We'll never fight in vain as the Lord will be fighting right alongside us. Amen? On the streets of Damascus, Syria, Ahim Ahmed plays a battered piano and sings the stories of the Syrian war. The last four years of civil war had produced, reduced his neighborhood to rubble, a neighborhood once home to rich and poor alike is nothing but a blasted, nothing but blasted brick and concrete and dust. And for the last year, Ahmed has dragged his piano out into the street to sing and play. He's run out of ideas on how to help his people, so he now plays and sings to uplift their spirits. And on many occasions, he's been joined by other survivors 
in an impromptu chorus. Sometimes it's the simple gestures that renew others' faith in God and strengthens our own faith. And still, the music plays on. So how do you approach the challenges that come your way daily? For many years, I thought of them as obstacles. And then I sought out the definition of each of those terms. The Oxford English Dictionary, the foremost expert on the English language, says this about these two words. Obstacle, noun, a thing that blocks one's way or prevents or hinders progress. Challenge, a noun, a task or situation to test someone's abilities, a call to take part in a contest or competition. You notice the difference? An obstacle prevents or hinders, but a challenge tests one's abilities. I decided from that point on that I would never, ever encounter an obstacle again. But instead, I would always face a challenge. Friends, when you change your mindset, it can do wonders for your outlook on life. Amen? I must confess, though, that I've not always won every challenge, but it's not because I haven't tried and put in the effort that I needed to succeed. In 2 Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8, the Bible says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not only me, uh, not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Paul is telling us here in his final days that he suffered pain, indignation, and imprisonment while spreading the gospel but he also grew while doing it. And now a treasure of immeasurable worth awaits him. He also knew that although death approaches, what he has accomplished would not die with him. The gospel message will continue to spread because of his efforts and his ministry, amen? We often hear that our job as Christians is to plant the seed of hope in others and that it's God's job to water and nourish that seed to make it grow. The truth is, friends, no seed will be planted if we give up, will it? 16% of Christians have said yes when when they've been asked if they've felt like they've been a failure. We need to learn to overcome and to adapt when faced with a challenge. How did Paul succeed in his ministry? Well, it was through prayer, was it not? Do you not think that he had moments of doubt and fear and despair in his life? I believe he most certainly did. But he also knew that his strength came from the Lord and he must always go to the Lord when things looked bleak and even when things looked cheery and well. Hebrews 12 verses 1 and 2 tells us, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Indeed, the moment we step out of the door of our house Every day, a cloud of witnesses watches our every step also. 
They want to see us fail. They want to see us hang our heads in shame. Personally, friends, I don't want to give them that pleasure. Do you? I remember a story about a young boy who came home from school with his report card in hand. As his father glanced at it, he noticed that it was filled with red ink and poor grades. What do you have to say about this? His father asked. Dad, the boy replied, you can be proud of me. You know I haven't been cheating. Sometimes we have to look for the silver lining in the clouds, no way. And remember, we should never look back, but always continue to look forward. The prize is always in front of us. <clears throat> Lou Holtz, a famous coach, once made this statement, ability is what you are capable of doing. Motivation determines what you actually do. Attitude determines how well you do it. In other words, my attitude dictates my performance. This is similar to the concept of whether you face an obstacle or a challenge. How do we keep hope alive in the face, face of all the trials and challenges that come our way each day? Well, first we need to look at what kills hope or what weakens it. <clears throat> Discouragement, suffering, exhaustion, whether that be physical or spiritual, and time. They all play a part in killing hope or weakening it. Isn't that true? Proverbs 13 verse 12 says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. You know, I've been a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church since I was 25 years old. I'm now 72. And I've been hearing every year, many times a year, that Jesus is coming back soon. Time's running out, though, for me to be able to see that glorious return of Christ in, per in person. But I'll not give up the hope of seeing him when he does come. Hope is something we have to maintain, friends. It isn't automatic. We have to have faith. We have to have daily prayer. And we have to have daily Bible study, do we not? Otherwise, our hope will atrophy and die. One thing we need to remember, our lives are very short compared to the heavenly host. In Psalms 90, verse 4, the Bible says, For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, and like a watch in the night. And 2 Peter 3, verses 8 and 9 says this, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. <clears throat> Time may move agonizingly slow for us when it comes to the arrival of the second coming of Christ. Every day, every hour can chip away at our faith and hope in our Savior's return. We may even find ourselves asking, will he ever come? Will he ever arrive? <clears throat> you know, between the time Adam and Eve were thrown out of the Garden of Eden and Jesus was born in Bethlehem, how many years had passed? And how many lambs were sacrificed? Do you not think that our forefathers also wondered when the Messiah would come? In Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5, the Bible tells us, But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, 
that we might receive the adoption as sons. Yet Christ did come, didn't he? And he did fulfill the promise in Genesis 3, 15, which says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Brothers and sisters, we can see with everything that is happening in today's world that the time is drawing very, very near. Is it not? With wars and disasters and famines and earthquakes, fires, droughts, diseases such as COVID-19, even our government, even our, even our government in this country and governments around the world are failing or they're changing drastically each day. All this is evidence of the deterioration of mankind. Even rules about religion are changing worldwide and here in our own country. The government has begun to dictate at times what can be, what can be and cannot be said from the pulpit. But friends, instead of being despondent, we should be cheering. Why? Because it all points to the final days and Jesus' triumphant return. Amen? God sees all of this happening and he's readying the heavenly host even today. He has a plan and a purpose. He's made promises and friends, he will keep those promises. God has set a time for his second coming. As we're told in Galatians 6 verse 9, and let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Let me ask you this. How would you score, or how would you score yourself on a test that determined how you measure up as a Christian. On the surface, it probably appears that everything is okay. In fact, I'm convinced that most everyone here would say if asked, how is your walk with God going? He would say, just fine. Kind of reminds me of the story about a man who showed up for a court hearing concerning an accident in which he had been involved. His arm was in a cast, and there were bandages covering a great deal of his body. And the parts that were exposed were clearly covered with bruises and scratches and cuts. The judge asked about his injuries, and he replied, Judge, I'm in a terrible condition. The judge says, I don't understand. The incident report filed by the officer at the scene at the time of the accident says that you were stated as saying you were doing just fine. <clears throat> well, the man said, Judge, I'd like to explain. I was driving my pickup and pulling a trailer. In the back of the truck was my old dog, Shep, and my mule was in the trailer that I was pulling. All of a sudden, an 18-wheeler sideswiped me, knocking me off the road. As a result, my pickup truck and trailer rolled over and down a steep embankment. The next thing I remember, a police officer was picking his way through the wreckage and came across my mule. After he made a quick examination of the situation, I saw him take out his gun and shoot my mule between the eyes. Next, he found old Shep, and after examining him, he shot him too. Now judge, he then walked over to me and asked how I was doing. I looked up at him, all broken up and hurting, and I said, I'm doing just fine. <laughs> Paul challenged the Corinthians and us to examine and to test ourselves to see how we measure up. In 2 Corinthians 13 verse five, Paul says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. 
Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. This passage urges us to give ourselves a self-checkup and that we should be looking for a growing awareness of Christ's presence in our lives every day. Paul says we should be doing this examination to see whether or not you're in the faith. In Hebrews 2, verses 1 to 3, Paul's warning us to pay attention. Here he says, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which is at the, at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? And in Hebrews 3, verses 12 to 14, he continues, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. So friends, is it really possible to know how we stand with God? Well, this is what the scripture says in 1 John 5, verses 12 and 13. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. And in John 14, verses 16 and 17, Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. We can be assured that the Holy Spirit lives in us, and thus we can embrace it. Amen? Sometimes life's challenges can cause us anxiety and worry. The only true way to examine ourselves is to search the scriptures daily and to pray. Amen? We cannot trust our own feelings. Here's a few questions that we need to ask ourselves each day. Number one, is Christ in me? Galatians 3.27 tells us, For as many of you as who were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now Paul relates this to a cultural understanding of becoming an adult. In Roman society, youth becoming of age laid aside the robe of childhood and put on a new toga representing adulthood. By becoming Christians, the Galatians were putting on Christ and were ready to take on the privileges and the responsibilities of Christ. They became a new person with a new lifestyle, a new attitude, and new intentions. Number two, am I keeping the commandments of God. In John 14, verse 21, we read, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. A Christian will make more than merely lip service to God. Amen? A Christian demonstrates his love for God by keeping his commandments. Love means more than words. It requires commitment and action. And three, am I, am I abiding in his word? The Bible says in John 31, 
or John 8, verse 31 and 32, then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This should not be taken out of context as some people in the world do. Jesus did not die to guarantee a wide range of personal freedoms of expression. Jesus promised freedom from the slavery of sin. That freedom begins when we understand the truth of God's message of forgiveness. And we die to sin by surrendering ourselves to his plan for salvation. And four, am I bearing fruit? In Galatians 5, verses 22 to 25, the Bible tells us, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. When you neglect to spend time with Christ in his word and in prayer, are you giving him the impression that he's not that important to you? Staying in daily communion with Jesus should be the number one priority in every Christian's life. Amen? It's the key to opening every door to bearing much fruit, and it adds a blessing to our lives. And five, do I have the proper attitude and frame of mind? Philippians 3, verses 15 to 17 says, Therefore let, it, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind, and if anything, you think, uh, if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us be of the same mind. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who walk as you have seen us as a pattern. You know, I look out over this congregation this morning and I see that most of us here as members and as visitors are, shall we say, a little bit aged. Not all of us, there are some young people here. So I want to look at a few of the challenges and hopes for this aging generation. You know, we all know the children's hymn, Jesus Loves Me, do we not? But I want to change it up just a little bit. And you can help me by singing the chorus with me as I sing each of the verses. So I'll begin with verse one. Jesus loves me, this I know, though my hair is white as snow, though my sight is growing dim, still he bids me trust in him. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. <laughs> Verse two, though my steps are oh so slow, with my hand in his I'll go. On through life, let come what may, he'll be there to lead the way. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Verse three, though I am no longer young, I have much which he's begun. Let me serve Christ with a smile. Go with others the extra mile. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Thank you. Y'all did great. <clears throat> you know, in his book called The Call, author Os Guinness reminds us that we never really retire from our calling. He says, no longer on the job, yet hearing the caller's voice, 
many retired persons occupy what the author calls the land between. The land between is living between the here and now in a place far beyond our wildest imaginations. Heaven is described in the book of Revelation as a place of glad reunions, of endless time, of security, where there is no terror, no pain, no disease, no sin, no death. Friends, the truth is, despite aging, older adults determine their happiness in this land in between. Do we not? I want to consider of the, some of the characteristics and qualities or practices along this journey that may help us all navigate the land between. And young people here, pay attention because these things pertain to you as well. For instance, number one, living with hopeful, hopeful expectation. The pull of the past exerts a powerful force on the actions of retired people and young people as well. We can certainly learn from our forefathers' achievements and contributions as well as their shortcomings and limitations, can we not? Biblically, biblical history relates how the Jews, who were people of faith and hope, despite tribulation clung to the expectation that the Messiah would come and the world would be a better place. And two, we need to grow as lifelong, lifelong learners. Friends, it's dangerous to assume that wisdom comes to those whose hair turns gray or falls out. A biblical knowledge points out that an understanding mind develops out of, out of a lifelong struggle for knowledge. Bible examples challenge us all to become, to become lifelong learners. Moses, Joshua, Caleb, Simeon, and others represent the best in lifelong learning. Lessons from these examples present a demanding challenge for growth for every generation. True wisdom comes from God, and it is grasped by learning the lessons of life through discipline and obedience. Proverbs 1 verse 7 tells us, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And Proverbs 6, 23 says, For the commandment is a lamp, and the law a light. Reproofs of instructions are the way of life. We, may, we need to dedicate ourselves to personal discipline that we may acquire the wisdom of the ages. Amen? And three, we need to practice gratitude. Gratitude opens the door to more and better relationship. Gratitude improves our physical health, and it improves our mental and spiritual health as well. And gratitude enhances our empathy and reduces aggression. And gratitude even helps people sleep better. Amen? Scripture agrees. In 1 Thessalonians 5.18, the Bible says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Friends, count your blessings. Name them one by one. Be thankful every day of your life. Philippians 4.8 reminds us, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And four, we need to cultivate generosity. Many of us 
have accumulated a lot of stuff through the years, have we not? Unfortunately, I'm really guilty of this one, as Phyllis would, I'm sure, agree. One of the best solutions for an overabundance of possessions is to eliminate the things that are no longer useful or of value in this particular stage in your life. You remember the parable of the rich fool in Luke 12? A rich man tore down his barns and he built bigger ones to store his harvest. Luke 12 verses 19 and 21 records it this way. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will these things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Someone once said, a decision to seek security in material things automatically withers the soul. Instead, we need to discover the joy of being centered in Christ by being one with him. A generous heart tunes itself to the very character of Jesus Christ. Amen? In Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4, the Bible says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Friends, generosity expresses its giving spirit in acts of kindness, in friendliness, in compassion. It's not just in monetary giving, but in giving of ourselves. And we should have a willingness to listen to and to pray for others. So brothers and sisters, this morning, ask yourself, is Christ in me? Have I put on Christ? Am I abiding in his word? Am I bearing much fruit? Matthew 6.33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Do we really accept God as our provider? We should. And do we strive to help others through life's struggles? Again, we should. As Paul is writing to the Philippians, he's undergoing terrible trials and hardships, yet Paul admonishes us to have joy, rejoice, and to praise God. Remember in our scripture reading this morning in Philippians 3, verse 14 says, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I'd like to be part of that chorus that sings hallelujah, Christ is king. Amen? I want to be there as the music plays on. Don't you? Shall we pray? Most heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the ability, for the honor, for the glory, Lord, to depend entirely upon you, that you will strengthen us, that you will grow us in our faith and in our knowledge and even in our trust in you. Lord, we ask this morning that this message will resonate strongly within the hearts of each of us here in this place this morning. And that during this coming week, we'll think strongly about these things. And we'll continue to search your word and pray each day, not only for our needs, but those of others that we run across. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do in our lives each day. In Jesus' name, amen.